Now, the Baltimore Ravens insider. Here is ESPN's Jamison Hensley on WBAL News Radio 1090, FM 101.5, and the WBAL mobile app. Hope everyone is having a great day out there. And to start with a programming note, this is our final Sunday edition of the Ravens Insider. But this is actually good news because this means Ravens training camp is about to kick off. Yes, the weeks and weeks of waiting are almost over. On Wednesday, keep it here on WBAL for updates of the Ravens' first full team practice. On Wednesday night at 7, we will have a 30-minute special honoring Ravens superfan Mo Gabba on the one-year anniversary of his death. Then from 7.30 to 9, I will host the first Ravens training camp insider report of the year. Yes, I'm very excited <laughs> for, for, for that program. I will give you all of my observations From practice, exactly. How did Lamar Jackson look? How did the wide receivers look? Uh, You know, who stood out as far as the pass rush? We'll also hear from Coach John Harbaugh as well as other players. And with the Ravens in training camp, tune it to WBAL every night. The usual program is from 7 to 8 for all of my reports. Now, the big talk around the NFL, you know, of course, is the start of NFL training camps all over the league. Uh, Three teams have already begun their full teams. Uh, It's the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, the Pittsburgh Steelers, and the Dallas Cowboys. The rest of the league, like the Ravens, will begin on Wednesday. But the other, really the the thing that is really uh, creating a buzz around the NFL has been vaccinations. Much like the rest of the world, there has been a debate among the NFL and players and even coaches, about whether you should get the vaccine. And the NFL created a stir on social media with players after issuing this memo that described the ramifications for COVID outbreaks in 2021. The NFL said in this memo, a forfeit would be declared for a postponed game that can't be rescheduled within the 18-week framework of the season. Now, here's, here's the kicker. Here's what really got the player's attention. If a forfeit happens, players on both teams would lose their game checks. Not just the team that had the COVID outbreak that forced the, the, the game not to be played. Both teams, those players, will not get paid. Some players say, hey, wait a second, NFL they're, they're they're forcing us to get vaccinated. What what about our freedom? You know, we, we, what is happening here? No, the NFL is simply stating the consequences for those who do not get vaccinated. This is not a political stance. It's not a social stance. Honestly, it's not really a the NFL being concerned about the health of, of their players and and if they get COVID. No, this is a business decision. The fact is. If you get vaccinated, you're more likely not to get COVID. And if you do get COVID, you're likely not to get seriously ill if you're vaccinated. This means you have a better chance of being available. You have a better chance of suiting up every game day to play with the vaccine than without it. That's what it boils down to. The NFL and everybody, everybody that followed the NFL last year knows how hard it was to get every game played last year when there wasn't a vaccine. Remember how many times the the Ravens-Steelers game, remember that Thanksgiving game, got rescheduled because of the outbreak with the Ravens. Now there is a way to increase the odds of getting those games played. No one, really, no one should be surprised by this. This is what... A smart billion dollar business should do. The NFL can't mandate vaccines for players because of the players union. They can't say every player has to get a vaccine before you report to training camp. No, but the, but, and that really that the players still, even with this, this memo, the players still have the freedom to decide whether to get the shot or not. Now, if you choose not to get it, there is going to be a risk a big risk in terms of your wallet. 
Now, Ravens, uh, Ravens cornerback Marlon Humphrey, he tweeted out, get the vaccines, fellas. Now, others have not been as amicable <laughs> as Marlon Humphrey. Cardinals wide receiver DeAndre Hopkins, the, I mean, the all-pro wide receiver, he threatened to retire. Or, you know, he posted on, on Twitter threatening to retire rather than getting the vaccine. Now, he quickly realized how idiotic that was and quickly deleted it. But And, and then he, he did proclaim on Twitter he could play for another nine more years. Now, there's others that are even – Gone even you know stronger in another direction of of venting their anger. Former Ravens linebacker Matthew Judon expressed his frustration with this new policy. He tweeted out, "The NFLPA expletive sucks." Ravens defensive end Derek Wolf he retweeted that. He basically saying, "You know what? I agree with this." But again, the players' union, like the NFL, they just want to do everything in their power to get the games played. This isn't about players' rights. This is what is best for the game. And it's not just the players. Vikings offensive line coach and their run game coordinator, Rick Dennison, he's out in Minnesota after refusing to get vaccinated. Because unlike the players, the league can mandate that all coaches, front office, scouts, they all have to get vaccinated. Now, Dennison, he was the Ravens coach. If that name sounds familiar, Dennison was the Ravens quarterback coach back in 2014, which a lot of people believe was Joe Flacco's best statistical season. Now, the Ravens announced last month, this isn't a problem for them because the Ravens announced last month that their entire coaching staff has been vaccinated. Back in minicamp last month, Ravens coach John Harbaugh, he addressed the number of vaccinated players on his team. Uh, I do have that number. It's a, it's a, it's a pretty high number. Um, pretty well above 50%, I would say, without giving the exact number. But, you know, that's really not important in terms of uh, individual guys. I think everybody makes that choice for themselves. That's what I told the guys last night. It's your, individ it's your individual decision. Uh, there are things that go with being vaccinated. There are things that go with not being vaccinated. So everybody understands that, and guys will make those choices for themselves. Now, in reality, more NFL players are getting vaccinated than people in their age range. The NFL announced, uh, what was it on Friday, that 80% of players have had at least one shot of the COVID-19 vaccine. Nine teams now have more than 90% of their players vaccinated. You now, kind of on the other spectrum, five teams at the bottom are with less than 70% of their players vaccinated. This is Ravens defensive end Clayus Campbell on how much vaccinations were a topic of conversation during the offseason workouts last month. Um, I think it really comes down to it is just, uh, you know, comfort level of the person that to do what's best for them. Uh, you know, I personally am vac vaccinated, uh, you know, um, but, you know, it's to each their own, you know, and they got, you know, each person has to do their own research and figure out what's best for them in their current uh, situation. But as a team, I think we're, you know, uh, we're working towards something great here. And, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, everybody supports each other. The Ravens are set to begin their 26th training camp here in Baltimore. And someone who knows a lot of those training camps <laughs> being out there sweating, whether it was in Westminster or now in Owings Mills, WBAL's own Keith Mills. And Keith, thank you so much for coming on the show. And, and we will get to some Ravens talk. But first, uh, you tweeted out earlier uh, this week about how you were in attendance. You were actually courtside in 1971 when the Bucks, the Milwaukee Bucks, last won their NBA title, and that was in Baltimore. And Keith, I know some of our listeners don't even remember an NBA team in right. Baltimore. Uh, what do you remember? The, the you remember talking about the last time the Bucks won and, and against the, those uh, old Baltimore Bullets. Yeah, it was an amazing time, um, uh, JMO. I was 14, and long before, uh, you know, ABC and the networks had all these big production units, uh, right. they used the local crews when they were in each city. So, as you know, my father worked at Channel 13 for 40 years, and uh, he mm -hmm. was uh, one of the camera operators for their production crew. I was actually uh -oh. sitting on the Bucks bench during <laughs> Game 3, and because there was a, it was a mounted camera operated by a guy named Gene Muir, and I was kind of sitting next to him, right next to the Bucks bench. They were coached by Larry Costello. And for those that don't remember, it was the rookie year of young Lou Alcindor, who uh, became wow. uh, 
you know, uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. They had Oscar Robertson and Bobby Dandridge, who would later join the Bullets when they moved to uh, Landover and won the championship. But it was an unbelievable um, uh, event. The Bullets had Wes Unseld, Gus Johnson, Earl Monroe, uh, you know, Freddie Carter and those guys. And Gus and Wes were hurt, and the Bucks swept them in four. But I'll never forget seeing Lou, a young Lou Alcindor run up and down the court like like he was six foot two and not seven mm -hmm. foot one. Just an unbelievable athlete. But the but the man of the hour for me was Oscar Robertson, even though Earl Monroe was my favorite player big o. probably of all time. The big O who my father loved was just uh, larger than life. But it was quite it was quite a quite a quite a memory. Yeah, it's quite quite different, and, and I would love to see uh, any kid nowadays try try to sit on an NBA bench, yeah. especially toward the NBA finals. <laughs> uh, well, we were pregame, and this is like two hours before the game. Um, you know, a lot of guys would come out and shoot around. They had um, a guy named Guy Smith, who was one of their, their fifth men, and John McLaughlin, who was another guard. Uh, me and another kid were just feeding them balls under the basket, like we were the ball boys. <laughs> There's nobody else That's there. Awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> it was pretty cool. Yeah, and, keep, and, and kind of going with the theme of, you know, kind of our old Baltimore uh, sports teams these days, uh, the Indianapolis Colts announced that they are going to introduce their 1956 throwback uniforms uh, later in November. Uh, obviously, uh, in 1956, the Colts were not in Indianapolis. They were yes. here in Baltimore. Yes. Uh, how, how is kind of your feeling? I know we, we talked and we've talked a lot in the past about how we have kind of distanced ourselves with, yeah. with the Ravens and they're winning. We've kind of gone forward at least as football fans along with the Ravens. But when you hear something like this, kind of what is your reaction? Well, my reaction initially, JMO, was that there's going to be some old cold fans still kicking who got a little <laughs> life left that are going to be storming the gates in Indianapolis that day. Uh, not a happy camper, but hey, no. a lot of old wounds reopened, I think, yesterday a little bit. Raymond Berry, Johnny Yu, Lenny Moore, uh, Art Donovan. Uh, when the team moved, they never, ever associated themselves with the Indianapolis right. Colts, which were still owned at that time by Robert Ursay. Even Johnny yeah. U, as, as diplomatic and as classy as he is, uh, would always take the fifth and say, hey, we're not the Indianapolis Colts. We're the Baltimore Colts. So, I mean, they'll, they'll, they'll get through it out there, and it'll be a, uh, you know, a, tough, a tough thing to watch for a lot of old Colt fans, all Baltimore football fans. But uh, I just think it's, it's a real – it's very insensitive for the league to kind of do that, to be bluntly honest with you. Yeah. And I will say, hey, I, I, we have long kind of oh, yeah. uh, adopted the, the Ravens, I think. But I will say that when you see those Colts uniforms, they are oh. still the, one of the classiest uniforms in the NFL. I mean, that with just with that horseshoe and everything, uh, that still gets me a little bit. It's just that that uniform and that logo was just so perfect. Uh, here in Baltimore, and, I, and it, just still seeing it kind of throws me off just a little bit. Oh, uh, no question. <laughs> Every time, once in a while, you think, "Oh, the, Col the Baltimore Colts are playing." Oh, wait a minute, they're never in Indianapolis. No, I <laughs> no. lost yeah, my head these, there a little. These these days, it's still hard to even say San Diego or Los Angeles Chargers instead of San Diego yeah. Chargers. That's what a lot exactly. of people are still getting used to. And uh, we're talking with WBALs Keith Mills and Keith now with the Ravens coming into this season. You know, a, a lot of expectations, of course, on on this team. Uh, as far as training camp, what, what's kind of your thoughts and, and what are you excited to see when the Ravens get, get on that field on Wednesday? Uh, two parts to that. One is the fact that the fans are going to be back out, Jameis. Yes. And I think we all are happy about that. Right, brother? Man. That's, oh, it, that's... yeah. I mean, that's the one thing you you can try to reinvent a lot of things. Uh, and they, they really did. They, they try to get normalcy through the pandemic. But one thing you really can't orchestrate is the emotion and the energy level that just fans bring to practice. No, no question about it. I think the players are really looking forward to it, judging from some of the tweets we've, we've read the last couple of weeks when it was announced they'd be there. But, but like most people, uh, obviously going to be, um, you know, looking a lot at, uh, at Lamar and, and now in his fourth year and the progression that uh, everybody's expecting him to make this year. Also, of course, the, uh, the new look offensive line, to me, that is number one in, in my storylines going into the football season this mm -hmm. year is one, um, you know, it, will Ronnie Stanley be able to come back healthy? Uh, obviously, he's not going to start practice, but everyone right. expecting him to start the season, according to John Harbaugh. And two, how do they replace uh, Orlando Brown on the other side? Will Orlando Villanueva be able to uh, do what Zeus did the last couple of years, which was just pound people into submission in the run game? <laughs> right. And uh, the transition from Bradley Bozeman 
uh, from guard to center, which uh, we all know some of the issues that the center position caused at the end of last year. Uh, and, and obviously the young kids, you know, Rashad Bateman, uh, Ood and Nod, mm-hmm. a lot of us during minicamp uh, and, and OTAs, JMO, as you know, uh, but some of the kids too that uh, were drafted a little bit lower, like Dalen Hayes, who was very impressive yes. in training camp. Looking forward to seeing him uh, with the big boys out there as well. So uh, a lot to look forward to. Uh, a, a lot of um, a lot of preseason hype for the team again in terms of Super Bowl contenders, and we'll see if they can live up to that as well. Yeah, and, and Keith, I know there will be a lot of uh, as always, and it's been that way even with Joe Flacco, but with Lamar Jackson, uh, him throwing the ball is always kind of under the microscope, even in, in in training camp. I mean, do you think that kind of gets overblown? And I mean, do you feel like there are certain players we've seen some athletes who sometimes they're just better when the game comes on and and maybe because of Lamar Jackson's skill set it just it, it, he naturally be, is better during the games than than any practice do you think kind of dissecting Lamar Jackson at this point in his career uh during training camp practice does that kind of get just overblown and and and, and gets put maybe magnified more than it should yeah and I don't think it's just him I think it's pretty much a lot of young players now and regardless of the sport um you know mm-hmm. it's so easy to tweet out during a practice and we all do it uh who's looking good who's not but I don't think I've ever seen anything like this Lamar Jackson scrutiny uh even though e- even since he's had all this success in the league right. I mean uh it's it's pretty remarkable to be blunt, bluntly honest with you even the entire um uh, uproar over the camp he had a couple of weeks ago or even last week down in in Pompano um Um, I've never, I can never remember, um, the the kind of scrutiny given to a a, a camp for kids. The fact that they're worried about him blowing his knee out when he's just having fun (laughs) with the kids out there. So maybe it's just Lamar. Maybe it's a sign of the times. I think it's a collection of both, uh, all of the above, but I can't remember ever. I'll tell you what, I can't remember ever seeing in OTAs, a player more scrutinized, uh, and, and every passing attempt he took than that kid. Man, and, yeah, and you I hope he's developed a thick skin because, man, it's that's tough to be Lamar Jackson this day and age. Yeah, I know there's a lot of former athletes that are very, very happy social media wasn't around when they were <laughs> when they were going about out and about town because I think Ooh. they were doing things a little bit more than just hanging out and, and, and playing with kids. <laughs> oh, you mentioned the old Colts? You kidding me? Oh, oh yes. <laughs> Those guys spent more time out than you and I did, let me tell you. Right, no. <laughs> quarterback Lamar Jackson if you follow him on Instagram on Twitter you saw that he reported to the Under Armour Performance Center on Thursday the rest of the veterans will report to training camp in Owings Mills on Tuesday the Ravens placed four players on the physically unable to perform list and none of this is a surprise offensive tackle Ronnie Stanley tight end Nick Boyle inside linebacker Otara Alaka and cornerback Iman Marshall. Now, Stanley and Boyle, they had season-ending surgeries, uh, and uh, John Harbaugh really said it was doubtful that Stanley or Boyle would be ready for the very start of training camp. Both are expected to participate at some point uh, in, in camp, and they are really, they, and Harbaugh expressed no real concern uh, about them uh, not being ready. Uh, for the start of the season. And they can all practice once they're activated off this list. This is just uh, kind of gives them a safety net in case there is any kind of setbacks where they're unable to play being on this list as they, as soon as they report uh, it's basically allows them when the 53 man roster happens, uh, they won't count against the 53 man roster. So it's a lot of it is very procedural at this point. Now the Ravens first team, First full team practice is Wednesday. Keep it here on WBAL News Radio 1090 all day. You can hear what's happening out on the field, what's being said after practice. I will host a 90 minute Ravens training camp insider report on Wednesday night starting at 7 30. Now, key to this Ravens training camp uh, and this Ravens offense this year will be the continued development of second year running back J.K. Dobbins. I asked him this offseason about his goals. For the upcoming year yeah the main goal is to do better than what i did last year but um you know this year i want to come in help my team in all ways possible on that field to get to the super bowl which it could be receiving it could be running it could be if we have another cramp cramp up game get out there throw the ball 
you know, things like that just help my team win a game. That's what I'm that's what I'm working towards right now. It's going pretty great. And Lamar Jackson's first two full seasons as the starting quarterback, the the Ravens have been the NFL's highest scoring team. So why did the Ravens, you know, biggest free agent additions and their top draft pick, why did both of them come on the offensive side of the ball? Well, because the Ravens, yes, they've averaged 31.2 points in the regular season under Lamar Jackson. But when it's come to the postseason and his three playoff losses, they've totaled a combined 32 points. So after the Ravens lost to, to uh, Buffalo in the divisional round, the Ravens, they addressed the offense. They signed guard Kevin Zeitler as well as wide receiver Sammy Watkins in free agency. They drafted wide receiver Rashad Bateman in the first round. So let's kind of do a, a little bit of deep dive on whether the Ravens are better, worse, or the same on offense. Now, at, on quarterback, no real additions. The The only loss was Robert Griffin III. Not a big surprise. We, we saw him when he made his only start uh, and really his most extended uh, appearance last year for the Ravens was at Pittsburgh. He just didn't look like an NFL quarterback at that point. I mean, he had he struggled throwing the ball downfield, struggled reading defenses, mainly made only plays with his legs. Uh, yes, he has more experience than any other quarterbacks on, in that quarterback room, but at this point, what they what you saw out of the other young backups, Trace McSorley and Tyler Huntley, I think the Ravens were intrigued enough by that to say, okay, let's let's go with those those two guys. And so, yeah, it's a little bit of a gamble because if Lamar Jackson gets hurt, you're going to either Trace McSorley or Tyler Huntley. Both have minimal experience, much less starting experience in the NFL, but realistically if the Ravens would have gotten any backup quarterback I mean even Tyrod Taylor uh but they would have had to spend five million a year which they really didn't have as far as their cap I don't know if that would have really helped them I mean at this point if Lamar Jackson gets hurt for an extended period or or is done for the season the Ravens playoffs hopes are are done so I yeah I think McSorley or Huntley whoever wins that number two quarterback battle they will be able to help the Ravens in a pinch but realistically, if, if Lamar Jackson gets a significant injury, the, the Ravens season is, is <laughs> yeah, realistically is done by that point. Now, with the running back position, they added Nate McCrary, an undrafted rookie. They lost Mark Ingram. Uh, they cut him. And so, I mean, what you return, you have J.K. Dobbins, Gus Edwards, and Justice Hill. They also have Tyson Williams, as well as Pro Bowl fullback. Patrick Ricard. Uh, are, hey, are the Ravens better, worse, or the same at running back? Pretty much the same. I mean, yes, they lost Mark Ingram, but it's not much of a loss. I mean, he was a pro bowler in 2019, but he was a healthy scratch in six games last year, including including both playoff games. So as long as J.K. Dobbins, his continued uh, growth, uh, Gus, Gus Edwards, the Ravens know what they're getting from him. Justice, Edwards, Justice Hill, primarily a uh, a special teams player at this point, but still, this is a the basically the same running back group that they played with in the playoffs. Now, wide receiver, that's a different story because they added Sammy Watkins, Rashad Bateman, uh, Tylen Wallace, Deion Kane, Devin Gray. They did lose Willie Sneed. Uh, Chris Moore is more of a special teams guy. Uh, Des Bryant, who really didn't make much of an impact. I mean, you bring back Hollywood Brown, Miles Boykin, Devin Duvernay, James Prochet. So, I mean, this is a what you feel is an up-and-coming group. And if all things kind of land in the, the, the direction that the Ravens are hoping, this could be the best wide receiver group that the Ravens have had since that first year. Uh, when you had Michael Jackson and Derek Alexander and Jermaine Lewis, uh, th- this 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 wide receiver group has potential, but of course they have to really convert that into the regular season. The past two years, Lamar Jackson hasn't really thrown, hasn't really gotten the wide receivers involved. But with the additions the Ravens have made, this <laughs> so really what does it come down to? Are the Ravens better, worse, or the same at wide receiver? I would say better. And the Ravens are banking on it by the investment they've made in the offseason. Now, with tight ends, they had added in a trade Josh Oliver uh, from the Jacksonville Jaguars. They drafted Ben Mason. They returned Mark Andrews, Nick Boyle, as well as Eric Tomlinson. 
uh, this this group can be better because not only do you bring back Nick Boyle for what they hope to be a full season. Remember, he had that knee injury that where he missed almost half the year last year. Uh, then you also have Mark Andrews in a contract year, so you expect him to play a little bit better. And kind of the under the radar guy is Josh Oliver. You know, traded from the Jacksonville Jaguars, uh, has a lot of athleticism. Kind of reminds me of a raw Darren Waller. His biggest problem is staying healthy. But I think Josh Oliver, I'm not saying he's going to catch 50 or 60 passes, but he could be in that 20-25 catch range, uh, which I think could surprise a lot of people. Uh, so, you know, The Ravens traded a Seth Ralph pick for Oliver. It didn't really make a lot of headlines. But I think he could make an impact for the Ravens this year. And for the offensive line, better or worse or the same, better. And the Ravens, they're hoping that it's going to be better because you look at this offensive line changed throughout, pretty much top to bottom. Uh, they added Kevin Zeitler in free agency, Alejandro and Villanueva in free agency. So really, your your right side is made up of two veteran free agents. Uh, they drafted Ben Cleveland in the third round. They did lose Orlando Brown on that right tackle spot, but they're hoping Villanueva can kind of patch that up for a year. And then you have the return of Ronnie Stanley at left tackle. Bradley Bozeman is shifting from left guard to center. By all reports, uh, and I've watched him out there, he seems to be a very, you know, he played center at Alabama. Seems very natural for him. So uh, the Ravens were disappointed in their offensive line last year, made some wholesale changes this year. But we saw when the, the offense was really, really clicking back in 2019, Lamar Jackson's MVP season, a big key was the offensive line. So the Ravens are hoping that the turnover here will really make a big change on that offensive line. They'd be a little bit more consistent this year than they were in 2020. Ravens veterans, they report to training camp on Tuesday. But a lot of the rookies and uh, younger players, they've been filtering in at Owings Mills over the past week. And in that regard, the Ravens placed two players on the non-football injury list. It was rookie guard Ben Cleveland as well as tight end Jake Breland. Don't read too much into this. The team traditionally places players on this list when they fail the conditioning test upon reporting to training camp. So the players can begin practicing when they when they pass the test and they get activated off the list. So I, I don't anticipate Ben Cleveland missing any practice time in training camp. Now, as far as the Ravens' defense, continuity has been the key, and it really starts at the top. In Don Wink Martindale's three seasons as defensive coordinator, the Ravens rank first in the NFL in fewest yards given up and fewest points allowed. Can't get much better than that. Now, this season, the Ravens return all but one starter. They lost outside linebacker Matthew Judon to the New England Patriots in free agency. Now, the Ravens, because of this, they have the makings of being the NFL's number one defense and it would only be the third time in franchise history that they would achieve that mark. Now, a big cog in that defense has been Ravens nose tackle Brandon Williams, who was entering his ninth NFL season in 2013. Back in 2013, he was a rookie third-round pick on the defending Super Bowl champions. Now, he's 32 and one of the veteran leaders on this team. And I, now I see what, like, Haloti and Sizz were going through. Like, you just see new guys coming in every year, you know, see guys coming in and out. Um, but, you know, in the end, you just got to always keep the main thing the main thing. Regardless, when you step in this field, I mean, when you step in this building, you know, it's your team. And when you step on that field, you, you got to lead them. And we got to lead them to, you know, um, first of all, you know, being the best they can be in their position in their field and then helping the team at the end, you know, winning games. So that's the biggest goal. And in continuing our better, worse, or same, we'll get shift to the defensive side. And the defensive line, not many changes there. The added Jovan Swan, uh, he's an undrafted rookie. Uh, they did lose Jihad Ward in free agency. He went down to Jacksonville. But look at the returners. I mean, you returned Clayus Campbell, Brandon Williams, Derek Wolf, Justin Matabuke, as well as uh, you know other key reserves in Broderick Washington and Justin Ellis and Aaron Crawford. Now, there is some age 
to this group. When you talk about Campbell, Williams, and Wolf, that's your entire starting defensive line coming back, but they're all over the age of 30. And that's why Matabuke, we discussed earlier in the show, his progression is pivotal for this team because uh, I really do think he can press Derek Wolf for some some playing time and, and possibly even getting into that starting lineup because Justin Matabuke is kind of that next generation of defensive line. It, it's possible when we're looking at this team next year that Campbell and Williams are both gone. So right now, the kind of the future of this team, especially the defensive line, is Justin Matabuke. And I, I, I really do feel when you look at this team because they bring back all the the basically the core of this defensive line, they are the same. But if Calais Campbell bounces back, he wasn't he wasn't the Calais Campbell that we had seen in previous seasons when he was playing for the Arizona Cardinals and Jacksonville Jaguars. He, he had injury early. He then was infected with COVID, never really rebounded. I know he's he's getting older. He's in his mid-30s. But if he can bounce back this year and become an impact defensive lineman, even though they, they, they might look the same, I think the defensive line could be better. And it really hinges on Calais Campbell. Now, inside linebacker, they added Barrington Wade. He's an undrafted rookie. They didn't lose anybody. I mean, you look, they got Patrick Queen, LJ Fort, Malik Harrison, and Chris Board. They're all back. Uh, so, uh, when you, you know, are they better, worse, or the same? It's it's the same. And, I mean, the, the hope is that Patrick Queen gets better uh, as far as in coverage. Uh, the hope is that Malik Harrison, who kind of shared the, the other weak side inside linebacker spot with LJ Fort, in his second year, Malik Harrison maybe steps up and takes over that starting job. That's what the coaching staff wants him to do. So, I mean, as far as players, they could get better. But in terms of what the look of this inside linebacker group looks like, they're pretty much the same. Now, outside linebacker, a little bit different story. You know, Judon went to the New England Patriots. Yannick Ngakwe, he is now with the Las Vegas Raiders. But they brought back Tyson, uh, you know, Tyus Bowser. They brought back Pernell McPhee. They added two really good rookies in Odafe Owe in the first round and Dalen Hayes back in the fifth round. So uh, a little bit different here. And But you, if you just, on the surface, you're looking at this outside linebacker spot, are they better, worse, or the same? They're worse because you don't lose your best, out, best all-around outside linebacker in Judon and say, oh, you're better or you're the same. That's just not it. And even though Ngakwe was not a good fit with the Ravens, he was an accomplished pass rusher. So losing him, that also hurts. In fact, no current Ravens outside linebacker has produced more than five sacks in a season since 2016. But that creates a lot of opportunity for Owe and Hayes. Owe really impressed the coaching staff in the offseason. And Hayes, I thought he was the biggest surprise of all the, when you kind of look at that the day three draft picks, I thought he looked the best out there. So I think there's a lot of potential for this group. Now at cornerback, the Ravens added Brandon Stevens, a third round pick, Sean Wade, uh, a, a fifth round pick. Uh, you know, they did lose Traymon Williams, but I mean, look at the depth of this cornerback group. Marlon Humphrey, Marcus Peters, Tavon Young, Jimmy Smith, Anthony Averett. Those are five corners right there that you could make the argument they could be starting for other teams. In, this, in, the, in the NFL. So you have five starter caliber cornerbacks as well as two drafted rookies on this cornerback position. I mean, it's tough to find a deeper cornerback group in the NFL. So, Amy, are they better, worse, or the same? I think this could be a better group if Tavon Young stays healthy. That's a big if. He's missed over 40 games over the past four seasons because of injuries. And if Brandon Stevens, Stevens and, jo- and Sean Wade as rookies, if they make an impact as well. But still, uh, this, this is a talented, talented group. And we know how the Ravens love to invest at the cornerback position. And this is a deep, deep group. Now, at safety, where you go from cornerback where you have a deep group, safety, really one of the thinnest groups on the season, oh, on this team. Uh, they added 
or Darius Washington, and, and a, a, he was a, what they call a a high priority undrafted rookie, but still he was undrafted. Uh, they didn't lose anybody. They bring back Chuck Clark, Deshaun Elliott. Uh, you have Anthony Levine the, and Jordan Richards, but they're more special teams guys. But beyond Clark and Elliott, you don't have much. So I mean, they have held up. I will say that. But I, my feeling is, if something happens with Chuck Clark or Deshaun Elliott, because of the depth at corner, would not surprise me if they try to move Jimmy Smith uh, and, and see what he can do at safety. That, that's how thin they are at the safety position. We've seen how the Ravens have done this in the past. They have converted corners into safeties. They started with Rod Woodson. They did it with Lordarius Webb. I think Jimmy Smith could be that next guy who makes that transition to extend his career, go from corner to the safety position. He, ha- he has the size. He has the intelligence to do it. Let's see if the Ravens think that could be an option if anything happens to Chuck Clark or Deshaun Elliott. 